better? Yeah, all right. So I'm, uh, I'm Teeke, I work at the University of Groningen at the Katarn Astronomical Institute, where I'm a member of the group Omega Sen. And at Omega Sen, we do data intensive astronomy and astronomical uh, IT. More on that later. And today I will tell you about uh, Conda and in particular how we develop with and deploy code with Conda. At first, a few things about myself. Who am I? I did a long, long time ago a PhD in theoretical physics where I wrote code that analyzes infinite, infinite dimensional symmetry groups like this one. Uh, then I did a postdoc where I wrote code that does complicated symbolic equations like that one. And then I was fed up with academia or in particular with theoretical physics and I left for industry uh, to the nice guys, uh, local guys of uh, Bell Simple, who are hiring, I think, by the way. Uh, they're awesome. I wrote some code that helped sell mobile phones, but after a few years I got an offer I can't refuse from the university, and now I wrote code that helps produce images like this. Okay, so that's who I am, but who are we? Omega Sen. Uh, we uh, design, build, and maintain um, data handling systems for astronomical instruments. So that includes the software that we write, but also we buy the hardware and ma maintain that. Uh, so to name a few of the, the key projects that we do, there's not all of them, but a subset. One is uh, the news instrument at the very large telescope in Chile. Uh, it's not really, to s you can't see how big it is. Um, but this, this is not a render, by the way. It's an actual photograph. So this thing shoots frigging lasers at the bloody sky in order to, <laughs> to produce an artificial star such that it can calibrate the optics to always get a clean image regardless of whether there's any perturbations in the sky. So that, that's really cool. Uh, where I work on, uh, you can't really see this, uh, but this is, uh, um, uh, I, I work on the archive, the data archive for the Euclid, upcoming Euclid satellite. And this will take images of a big part of the sky in very high resolution such that we can map all the galaxies that there are, or all the galaxies you can see. So there will be billions of billions of galaxies that we will measure. And uh, all the dots here, let's see, where's the pointer? These are actually galaxies. So, uh, and we do this in order to hopefully uh, be able to answer some key unknown questions about the universe, such as what is dark energy and what is dark matter. Uh, lastly, uh, we also uh, run the Dot Groningen Planetarium. Every Tuesday, there's a show on the full dome, 22 meter dome in Dot, which is also quite awesome if you haven't been there please do, uh, and we do more stuff which I don't have time to talk about because I have a very strict chairman. All right, so let's move on. Uh, what is astronomical data reduction? Those are the key aspect of what we do. Um, we have a telescope and th that produces with, with a CCD a so-called raw frame, a raw image. And you see that it has lots of artifacts in that. So what you can do to uh, clear this up, and uh, so I'm not an astronomer, so I have to read this from, uh, from my notes, is you take a bias frame and that's the signal from the electronics without exposure. So you can see that you reproduce the, the artifacts there. And then in addition, you take a flat frame. This is the variation in pixel to pixel sensitivity. And you combine all these into a, what's called a, a reduced science frame. Um, and you do this multiple times for the same uh, frame, same CCD. And you combine this with all the CCDs that are in the detector. Um, and then with all this information, you can build a so-called co-edit frame. And on this, you can al almost do science. One last step y you do is you, you run some uh, analysis software on it, and you get a big table of all the sources, all the stars and galaxies uh, uh, in, the, in the image. And with this table, astronomers can do actual science. All right. So we have some software that, that does all this. How do we deploy this? Uh, how at least how... how that we used to deploy this. Well, we have a homegrown um, installation script um, that you download and you run. And what this does, it, it downloads and compiles some C and Fortran binaries. It downloads and installs shared libraries and it uh, clones the, um, uh, our Git repositories that contain the code that we wrote. And in addition, uh, it sets up a, uh, a very nice custom Python environment and in a pip installs third-party Python libraries. Now, this worked great, and it has worked great since, well, more than 15 years, but it's starting to feel its age a bit. And in particular, when we roll out to um, new installations, we usually get uh, some tricky uh, support questions because it's, it's a homegrown solution. You can't 
uh, Google this on Stack Overflow, though you have to Google us, and that's a bit annoying because we'd rather not give support on this. We'd rather give support on the science and not on install installing things. Um, so uh, I thought it would be a good idea to migrate this to something more modern, um, but we have a few re requirements for migration. So we'd like to have more broadly adopted tooling so people don't have to ask us. And we need to uh, be able to package Python and C and third party libraries. And in, in addition to that, uh, we'd like to have private repositories because not all the code we uh, deploy is uh, open source. When, yes, we need to support Python 2, hopefully not for long, uh, but we'd still need to do that. Um, and of course, uh, it has to be reproducible. You always uh, need to be able to get the same list of sources from the same set of raw frames in the end. And a lot of our users are, uh, are non-pseudo users, so we have to be able to install it as non-root. Now, uh, we're not the first people who to come up with this set of uh, requirements. And in fact, the nice guys from uh, Anaconda Inc. ran up to the same uh, set of requirements five years ago, and they came up with well, uh, Conda. And Conda is a system level package and environments manager that's in principle wholly Python agnostic. So what that means is that um, both Python uh, for ex and also, for example, HD5 and H55, that are all Python packages. Whereas for PIP, uh, you would only have the last one to be a Python package, uh, and the rest you'd have to install with your OS package manager like apt or yum. Uh, it's cross-platform, uh, it's uh, relocatable, so you don't have to be root to install things, and it's a binary package manager. So that means that the compilation takes place at packaging time and not at install time. So let me briefly walk through, let me briefly walk you through the ingredients that make up Conda. Um, first off, uh, we have Conda recipes, and these are simple uh, YAML configuration files that contain metadata and build instructions. Um, so this example here, uh, it's a package called swarp, and we have a version in there, and the other metadata is where you can get the source and uh, its hash. And in addition to that, we have the, the build instructions, so the, um, uh, the compilation time uh, dependencies and the uh, script that actually builds the package. And one thing to note here is that uh, this prefix argument. This is very important because it tells configure to install into a um, environment that's been set up by Conda build. And the way this works is that uh, Conda build makes this environment, it takes a snapshot of it before running these uh, script steps, and it takes a snapshot of it after running the, the script steps. And uh, the diff, it packs up into a zip tarball. All right, so how does this zip tarball look like? Well, it, it's a zip tarball that has a funky file name with the, uh, the version and the hash. And it basically contains everything that's been produced during the, the compilation step. So we have a binary here, we have uh, man pages here, and uh, Conda metadata here, which is used to, uh, which, which stores, for example, also the, the runtime dependencies. Uh, once you have a package like this, you can uh, upload it to a Conda channel. Uh, and Conda channel is basically a, a package repository. And this is nothing more than a directory containing a bunch of these uh, zip tarballs uh, and um, metadata that's generated by Conda index. And you can either serve this locally or over HTTP. And I've taken here a URL of a package you can download from Anaconda Cloud. Um, so that's, this is the domain of Anaconda Cloud and we have a channel name here and a subdirectory that indicates the platform you build for and the, the package file name. Now, since we don't want to rely uh, on third party uh, services, what we do is we uh, roll our own ch Conda channel. It's a basic HTTP file server with uh, simple HTTP authentication um, configuration and you can download packages from us. And when you install a package, um, it ends up in, in your Conda environment. Uh, Conda environment um, 
sits in your Conda installation tree. So basically, this is your whole Conda installation tree. You can install this wherever you want on your system. Um, and the, the environments live as a subdirectory inside there. And these environments are basically self-contained. Um, so they don't have any outside dependencies on the OS. Every, every library you need, every binary you need should be in there. Um, and when you activate an environment, the only thing Conda more or less does is it uh, prepends the, the binary directory to the path, and that's it. So <laughs> coming to our setup, we have a bunch of uh, Git repositories on our GitLab instance, um, which more or less all have the same structure. So we have, whoops, we have, uh, all of them have a single Conda recipe. It has a bunch of source files and it has GitLab instructions on how to build, uh, build, test, and upload your packages. So let's take a look at one of these, uh, so, uh, sorry, at one of these recipes. It's more or less the same as the recipe I've showed you before, but this is now is a pure Python package. And what we've done here um, uh, is that uh, we only have requirements for runtime on Python. We don't have any requirements for Python during build time. Um, and that's because we don't have any setup.pies in our uh, repositories. Um, so when we build, we just copy source files into the conda build provided site packages directory. And we don't run pip install uh, or uh, setup tools. And uh, one of the reasons we do this is that we don't have any duplication of the metadata. So we have metadata here, and otherwise we'd also have the metadata in setup.py, which we don't want. And one other thing to note is that we always, we always bump the, <coughs> the build number uh, when we run a new uh, uh, pipeline, because you don't want duplicate uh, package, uh, pff, sorry, you don't want duplicate uh, package file names. They you will always want them to be unique for a, a new build. All right, so that's, um, that's the uh, pure Python recipes. You already saw the static recipes, so we have one big repository with all the uh, recipes for C and Fortran binaries. Um, and uh, it also has a GitLab CI instruction file. I don't like duplication, so what we've done here is we've uh, taken all these uh, GitLab CI files and we just turned them into an include of a CI template for uh, Conda, and that has uh, the build, test, and upload stages. So let me briefly walk you through this, because it's, it's quite big, but it's, uh, it has some nice tricks up its sleeve. So we have three stages. So, th so now this is, not I call it Conda.yaml, but it's not, a YAML file for Conda, this is a YAML file for GitLab. So I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but this tells GitLab how to, to build these things. Um, and we set from the get-go two variables. So these are actually Conda variables that you yourself can set in your shell. Um, and the first one tells uh, Conda to uh, look for the configuration file inside the GitLab project. So if you have, want to have custom settings, you can add them there. And the second one is uh, it tells uh, Conda to look for the packages uh, also in the in the CI build directory because we want to cache those packages that we need for uh, testing. Now we have one abstract job that uh, oh, the only thing it does is it adds the adds our channel to the configuration, and then uh, the build step. Uh, um it builds the recipe uh, without testing it, and it makes, uh, puts it there, and it uh, turns it into an artifact to be passed along to the next job. And we only do this for the main branches, master and develop, and for merge requests. Now we come to the testing phase, where we have an abstract job that uh, tells GitLab to cache the, uh, the Conda packages directory. Uh, and what this does, it uh, it does conda build, but then test. So this doesn't build, it just tests the recipe. So you you, if you have a recipe that's being built, you can test it on its own. And we have two test jobs. Uh, one is for uh, before merge requests, where we only pull the cache, and one is after the merge request, after thing, things have already been merged, because um, 
uh, and, and that one also pushes the cache. And the reason we do this is that pulling the cache is a zero cost operation basically, but pushing the cache, updating the cache can be quite costly, especially when you have lots and lots of packages you, that you want to update. All right, so that's our, uh, our uh, build instructions. There's also an upload instruction, which is basically an rsync to the, the server hosting the combat channel, and then you can, you can download them there. All right, so how does that work? You can, uh, well, you can add our channel. You have to mind the single quotes here because there's a channel key that you don't want to leak into your new configuration file. Indeed, it doesn't leak. Good, and then you can install into your new environment Astro and our Astro package. And then comma thinks a bit and uh, you will get uh, a whole list of packages that it wants to install. Yes. Um, yeah, we're almost there with the P. Uh, no, yes, all right. Do we want to proceed? Uh, do I have a choice? Of course, yes. Good, but why, why is this list so big? I mean, it's humongous. Well, I told you that um, Conda environments are basically self-contained. So all the binaries and libraries that you need, you, you should sort of install as a dependency there. Uh, and uh, we can analyze this by looking at the dependency graph of, um, of the environment. So you, um, you open up the JSON files, you parse them, and you put them in your favorite graph uh, uh, analyzing tool, which for me is Mathematica, and you end up with something like this. All right, so I no, don't know if you can read this in the back, but so this is the uh, Astro package. Um, so this is sort of the top level thing, and at the bottom there's a lib where I can't read quite myself, but this is for, for uh, this is lib GCCNG, I think, so what we call low level system packages. Um, and one of the reasons why it's so big is uh, we can highlight the, the dependencies of Python. Python sits here in the middle. And you see that Python itself already has quite a number of dependencies. Um, and one of the nice things you can do when once you have this, this graph is you can, uh, you can see why a partic particular package was installed. So let's look at MKL. So MKL sits here, uh, and it has a number of incoming dependencies. But let's, uh, let's zoom in a bit and then see what these things are. I didn't spend too much time generating this. Uh, no, I did, but it's horrible. All right, um, so we have MKL here, and of course in the top sits Astro because we installed Astro, and you see that everything sort of comes down to NumPy. NumPy requires MKL. And if you, if you think, well, uh, MKL is nice, it can do fast floating point operations, but it's so big, I don't want this, I want to use OpenBLOSS or whatever, you can uh, modify your recipe for Astro to say I only want the no MKL version of NumPy and then you can get rid of NumPy. Well, this is nice, but uh, uh, I only do these things, uh, I only do conda commands on the command line, uh, so I don't want to sort of switch back and forth to uh, Mathematica. Uh, so what I did is I wrote a program that automatically does this for you. So you can install it from our uh, conda, uh, uh, from a public conda channel, and then you can just ask it to produce this graph view, and you will get the nice graph on the command line that tells you the exact same thing. Uh, so now this is the sort of the incoming graph of MKL, but you can also do outgoing graphs, so you can also see what the dependencies of MKL are. Um, but you, if you do a whole graph of the whole environment, then it won't fit in your terminal, so that's why I put the previous one uh, in Mathematica. All right, <coughs> so uh, of course we've, uh, we have some pain points. Oh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm done. <laughs> um, one of the uh, uh, beefs I have with Conda, or at least with Conda build is, um, Conda itself has a very nice full package syntax. So you can, you can specify the channel that, it, that you want uh, together with the uh, uh, package that you want to install. You can even sort of specify the uh, OS uh, flavor that you want. But you can't use this in Conda recipes. So and that's, that's a real bummer because you want the recipe sort of to be self-contained. But now it's not self-contained. It depends on your configuration of Conda uh, on what channels you've added. Uh, and that influences which packages it will download. So uh, I would really sort of love that this comes to Conda build as well. Another minor 
point is that uh, it's only glibc based, so there's no movable libc variant. And that uh, it's not really a pain point, but I find it a minor annoyance that when you build uh, Docker images based on Alpine, you always need to install glibc if you want to have a conda image. So conda images tend to be a bit bloated, tend to be a bit big. Another minor uh, beef uh, is that um, related to containers is that you can't easily build a container out of an existing environment. You can clone your environments within Conda, but you can't clone them into a container without doing some uh, some tricks. You can do it, but it's not a one-off command like it is, for example, in Gwix. And lastly, um, Conda develop is a bit limited. Wh what Conda develop does is basically it adds a directory to your Python path for your Conda environment. But if you want to start developing a, uh, on a uh, Python project that's that you want to build a Conda uh, package for, you also want to install, or you want to create a Conda environment with all the dependencies of that project. And Conda develop doesn't do this. So. And if so a few lessons learned. Um, when you build binary packages, you want to make sure that you only use the Conda provided compilers. And you don't, uh, you don't want to accidentally link to uh, libraries that that's been provided by the, your own operating system. Because when you ship your package to another host, those uh, shared binaries probably won't be there. And one way to do this is basically uh, to build in a container that doesn't have any GCC or OS provided compilers. Another thing is uh, you don't want to mix the, the Conda channels, Conda Forge and Conda Defaults. Well, most of the time this works out, out of okay, but uh, Conda Defaults is sort of a better behaved cousin uh, of Conda Forge. Um, and these packa the packages here are all being compiled with the new compilers, whereas the old ones, or the, uh, the ones in Conda Forge, they tend to be a bit outdated. Some of them are, haven't been updated yet and uh, they can be built with the old Conda tool chain. So when you mix these, you might get binary incompatibilities. Um, so what we do is we stick to Conda defaults and add on top of that packages from our own channel. Um, one other thing I already briefly mentioned uh, with the uh, pure Python uh, recipe is that you always uh, want to bump the version and or the, the number. You don't want to replace packages with the exact same version string. I mean, when you think of it, this is common sense, but somehow I had to sort of learn this lesson the hard way. Um, another thing I've shown is that you can cache packages during CI, uh, but you want to be careful when to update the cache. And I think, uh, I think that's it. We have some references here, so I wrote a bit of documentation uh, you can go and look at, uh, and I stole some bits and pieces from different presentations. But uh, I think, yeah, that's it. I'd like to thank you for your attention and your time. And if you have any questions, um, shoot.